What I'm proposing to do is I'm going to talk really about a sort of philosophy, but it will actually help um, and when we get to that, uh, when you're dealing with big. And of course, when I talk about big data sets, I'm not even talking about big data. When people use those two words together, that actually means a data set so big that you cannot deal with it on one computer. So you have to do it as a distributed uh, set of computers working in collaboration with each other. So that's big data, which we, none of us at this sort of conference ever get as far as. But we're talking you know, major, major data sets that uh, things like, well, way beyond sort of the whole of the US Medicare system and things like that. That's massive amounts of data. But we'll come back to what makes it data, data big. So, but there are loads of big data sets around. You've got something that's going to be more than a gigabyte or two, takes 20, 40, 60 minutes to download. So you know it's big. And you think, oh my God, what am I going to do? But there is a sort of, and this does go back to your question about do you join it up later? Don't get ahead of yourself. Keep calm. And I'm going to have talking to keep calm. So first of all, what's making it big? Just think about it. What is, what's making it big? It's either it's one of two things, or possibly two combined. Either it's very deep. That is, it's got a lot of stuff in it, uh, downwards. But it's not very wide, so you could have um, an example would be something like the, sorry, uh, the, a London phone book of the old days when there used to be four volumes. But what did you have in it? You had a name, initial, address, postcode, and phone number. Now, that's very little. It's quite a narrow, but deep, you know, it would be a big data set. But within that, what sort of stories could you look for? So the first question is always, before you get into the technical side of, oh shit, it's a really big data set. Just think, why do I want this? What's in it? So if it's deep and not very wide, there's not much detail in it. So what sort of stories would be in a London phone book? If you had all four million, five, six million subscribers listed, what, would you, what sort of questions could you ask it? The number of sub subscribers, the number of people called Smith. I mean, they're, they're frivolous stories in some ways. The number of people living in Ealing called Smith. The number of people living in Dulwich called Jones. Um, the number of people around a particular group of numbers. So not much you can ask it, but you can still ask it questions. And it will be big, but it's not huge. Then the one that we're probably more concerned with, it's really wide. And if we're doing it as rows and columns, it's dozens of columns, maybe. And it may not be so many rows. It might only be a few thousand. But it has a lot of detail in it, because detail is in the, is in the rows. So that makes stuff big. So immediately, when something's big, you think, there's going to be a lot of data in here. It's a big sample, but it's also got how much, how much detail. One of the ones that crashes my computer every time I open it, or it did a couple of years ago, um, is prescription data, prescribing data from um, GP surgeries in Britain, uh, England and Wales. And so you get about 4 million lines a month. So if you do it for the whole year, it's 48 to 50 million lines. Um, but it actually, the number of um, columns is not very big. It's uh, the medicine, well, the name, of the, the name address, uh, the uh, area, etc., cetera, of the, of the surgery, um, the drug, the, what it's used for, uh, codified, uh, the price, and the quantity. It's not very much in width, but it's very, very deep. There's loads in there. So you're thinking, can I measure by region, which has the most heart pills, which has the most antidepressants, and so on. But it's not a very, it's not a very rich data set in, in some senses. There are things you can ask it. But when it's really wide, does that mean you can ask more questions? N yeah, potentially there are more questions, but which questions do you want to ask it? I'll show you what I mean. So there's the my deep but not wide, not much to it. And here's one that's pretty deep and we're gonna, we'll come back to. This is price paid data from the land registry. So every sale of every property at, in the UK gets registered with the land registry. And this contains a whole load of stuff, including, as you can see, addresses and some very, various other codes over here. 
So it's quite wide and it's very deep. It's a year's worth of data is about just under a million transactions. So it's potentially quite interesting. First of all, you have to get to the data dictionary. But the data dictionary telling you what you've got, what's in there, what the codes mean, is a very vital tool. If you don't have that, you're guessing. But at the same time as you're looking to see what it all is and what it all means, you can start thinking of the sorts of questions it's going to be able to answer before you even try to open the data set. This is the, this is the key part. This is where you use, this is the sort of, if you like, the zen of big data, is you sit at your desk, you may not need a computer, just a pa pencil and paper, and you're thinking, okay, here is the stuff I can get. What questions can I ask? And we'll come back to this specific data set at the end and actually look at what we could ask it because there is an exercise in there for your own uh, state of mind of what sort of stories am I looking for. But when you see a data dictionary, part of it is, yes, I need to know what each column is, but also what the columns themselves are helps you know what questions you can ask it. And it means that when you get to such a big data set you can't download it all, it, you think, and you're going to use SQL, it then you, th you can then think, well, I can download only a part of it. I only need these columns. So you don't waste time, energy, bandwidth, downloading lots of stuff you actually don't need. It may be big because there's loads of stuff in it you don't need. So there is a natural tendency, and I was saying in an Excel session earlier, when you have these pages where you can download data, create filters and download data. I don't do that online. I download everything and filter it myself because I don't trust their filter. I want to see what my filter does. But when it's so big you can't download it, wouldn't it be much safer to say, OK, there's a whole load of columns off to the right I just don't want. So don't feel constrained to take everything all the time. Say, oh no, I, only, I actually only want five columns. And I only want everything from 2008 onwards. I don't want everything from 1998 onwards. Whatever it is. We'll come back and we'll look at um, the property one. But here's one. This is a massive data set and this also crashes my computer. And it shouldn't do really. But it is divided into three spreadsheets. Um, well, you download it as three CSV files. And it's road accidents in the UK. There are roughly, where the police attend and they take all sorts of records, there are roughly 50,000 a year, give or take. That means, uh, sorry, 150,000 a year. And there are 68 data points here, which means you've got, if you, in the 10 years of data you download, that gives you 102 million data points. Okay, that, that's a lot of accidents, one and a half million accidents uh, multiplied by the 68 data points. Um, now, this is going to be a thought experiment because you don't want to download it all. You certainly can't deal with it all. It's spread into three, uh, as I said, three Excel files, each of them linked by one unique thing, the accident index. Each accident gets a number. Um, now, more than one vehicle can have, a, can have a number because you can have more than one vehicle in an accident, obviously. Casualties, likewise, but the actual accident circumstances only appears once. So you have a unique accident index here, which is shared with casualties and vehicles depending on who they are and what they are. Looking at that, you've got w lots of stuff about where. Police force, uh, the location in lot latitude, longitude, um, ordnance survey, which local authority it was, what the name of the road was. So if it's the A1, the A2, you can just look and see what those are. Um, and they say first road because they mean the main road when there's two. If it's a, at a junction, they get both roads. The speed limit, uh, kind, and then they have codes for what kind of junction it is, roundabout, crossroads, traffic light controlled, uh, and so on. Uh, what the second road was, if it's an A or a B or an unmarked road, uh, and, and the number of it, the classification. If it was a pedestrian crossing, uh, what, how, what the light conditions were, all codified into single digits. Uh, weather conditions, wet, dry, etc. single digits for you, not text. Um, all this is in the data dictionary. You've got the accident severity, so one, two, and three. One is fatal, two is injuries, three is no injuries. Okay. Um, 
Then you've got all this sort of stuff, but hidden in here you've got things like the sex of the driver, age group, type of vehicle, propulsion, so diesel, petrol, electric these days, how old the car is, driver home area, and you've got another thing which I quite like. Well, there was, um, uh, where is it gone? Purpose, journey, journey purpose of driver. So one of them is even the school run. There's about four grades. And one of them is school run, driven by, and then you've got driven by student, driven by parent. So there's a lot of detail in here. That 102 million um, uh, data points gives you a lot to play with. You don't need it all. So have a little go. I was, uh, my idea was that there might be a, an audience here, and that if you were to work in pairs for a few minutes, see if you can imagine, just looking at those, ask it some questions. The main thing, and the thing I find most, that I say most often as a trainer, is that you should talk to your data. You interview your data. Even if it's big data, you still interview it. You ask it questions, and all you then need to work out is the technical way of asking the questions. So just have a little chat in pairs. See if you can think of a, a news story. I mean, the annoying thing is that this is usually six to 18 months out of date because it takes that long for the Department for Transport to publish it. So it's really historical, but there are there is a lot of detail in there, which is of current interest anyway. In a general statistical and uh, lifestyle sense, so have a quick go. I'll give you a couple of minutes just to sort of come up with some potential stories that combine questions you could ask it. There are loads. I think there are loads of stories in there. So let's hear let's hear some and let's cobble some together because the whole idea is this is this is you should just sit back and relax in front of a screen like that and and just take your time. So I, I think about this, I'm, I'm, this is very sad, but I think about this one a lot because I sort of know it, not by heart, but I'm, you know, I'm out for a walk and I'm thinking about data stories and I'm thinking, oh, I could combine that and that and I could ask it that. So, any, any ideas? Yeah. That's a, I mean... There's a, there's a fairly obvious uh, reason for asking that. So that's a, that's a great, great question. And of course, once you get into that and you've done the clicking required for that, doing the reverse and getting old old people injuring each other, there's a. I think straight away, there's a, it's, it's the sort of thing you could imagine being in a sort of inside page of the Guardian or something. That you know, the numbers. There's probably going to be something we don't quite expect in there. I don't know, but you know that. Old people injure each other much more than young people do, or not fatally, or something. I don't know. But there'd be something in there. Yeah, so using the age. So uh, also age of vehicle might... You can do age of person and age of vehicle. So old people with old cars, are they safer than young people with young cars? <laughs> the, I did do a day of the week thing. Now, what, what do you think? Do you think it's evenly distributed a seventh of the accidents each day? Hands up if you think Monday's the most popular day for accidents. Hands up if you think Tuesday's the most popular day. Wednesday? Friday. Th wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Thursday? <laughs> Friday? Yeah, Friday? Saturday? Sunday? What? Okay, the biggest day for accidents is? Friday. Friday. The biggest day for fatal accidents? Sunday. 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 And then which, what speed lim limit do you think is in force is the most popular for accidents? So 30, it, it's, they measure 30, 40, well 20, 30, 40, 50 and 60 and 70. 50 is correct. But things like that, so there's a, a thing where you can just take a big block because you've got 10 years of data and even if it's got a few blemishes in it, it's pretty robust. So you can start saying, all right, take a day of the week and you see there are days of the week when there are more accidents in certain speed limits. There are days of the week where there are times where um, 30 and 40, of course, doesn't have many fatal, fatal accidents. But then there's neither does 70. It's 50. 50 is the killer. Not because of the actual speed. It's just because the people going too fast are meeting people who are going much slower than them. And motorways are actually really safe. If you look at motorways, but then of course you've got to do a bit, bring in some other data because you're going to have to work out how how many miles of motorway and how many actual cars get driven on motorways. You know the mu passenger miles of motorway versus passenger miles of a roads. But in, in sheer numbers, motorways are 
safer. There are far fewer accidents on motorways on any day of the week. So doing that sort of thing, so using the road number, I've done one where I tried, because I used to drive up the A303 from Devon quite a lot, and it's a pretty awful road. So I just thought, OK, accidents on the A303. Basically, it just drew a map of the A303. <laughs> there seemed to be almost no corner of the A303 that had not had an accident. Um, so then things, you get into the technical stuff like skidding, using um, tow, vehicles are towing, which of course includes articulated lorries. Um, you've got uh, purpose of drivers, so you can start working out whether they're commercial drivers or pass uh, ordinary uh, passenger cars. Age band is really interesting. Engine capacity, more dangerous, which is, is it more dangerous to be in a small engine and be hit by big people because you can't go fast or vice versa? Hit people because they're going too slow. Um, things about what the pedestrian is doing. There is just so much in there. But my big point is, if you download that lot, and it is, uh, it's about three and a half, four gigabytes for the 10 years. So it's, it's, you know, it's 20 minutes, half an hour, or a lot of unzipping to do. But even then, when you open it, it just, it, it's very slow and it's hard work. So what you need to do, in that case, if you're going to combine all three, is to do it with SQL. And to do it nice, and just gently say, I only want, I don't know, I want speed limit, I want age of driver, sex of driver, uh, sex of casualty, whatever it is. I just want five or six columns. And then I'm going to take out all the stuff I don't need from, you know, I, firstly, I don't need other columns. Secondly, I'm going to filter those columns. So you get down to a much more manageable data set. If we're, do, if we're talking about this from a journalistic point of view, which I think we are, you don't want to smother yourself in data so that you, you can't, it takes you longer to dig your way out of it. So you want to get smaller amounts of data. You still know you've got access to everything. It's just think, no, because you can always go back with your SQL query and say, um, oh no, now I want that column as well. But if you try to get the whole lot in one go, it will just crash everything. And of course, each one is a separate year, so you have to do a bit of combining that way. Each year is, is about 100 to 150,000 events. Okay, but some of those will be, these ones are slightly smaller. The main, this one, is, has got a lot of columns anyway, and it's the full, it's all the accidents. But it, depending on how many casualties and things there were, this could be quite thin. This one's medium. The other thing about the doing, and then messing around, going back to the which day of the week, I was going to, you can also get, is it only one vehicle or is it more than one vehicle? And it's amazing how many single vehicle accidents, I, I, otherwise known as idiots, um, get involved in accidents at the weekend. Because either they don't drive the rest of the week and they're out of practice, or they're drunk, or they're stupid, or all three. So just to, as a thought, you see, it's, it's about just sitting and not, I mean, the number of times I've been on training courses with people, either as a trainee or training, and people get into the click mode where everything you do, they just click, 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 click. It happened today, somebody just clicked through everything and they nearly signed up for a, a new uh, um, Excel account just because they kept clicking yes. And I was going, no, stop, stop. So you don't click, click, click. What you do is you sit back and you think. You almost, like I say, taking, going for a walk and thinking about what you've got, sort of half memorizing the kind of columns you've got and thinking, what could I do when I get back to the office? What am I going to do with this? Instead of sitting in a mild panic in front of a screen and thinking, what the hell do I do? Much easier to treat it in a more relaxed way. But dreaming up combinations of columns that are going to give you interesting, um, interesting stories is, a, is, a, is the, the hard bit and yet the easy bit, because it makes your life easier at the end. If you've got that many data points, You'll never be able to deal with them all anyway, so you've got to narrow it down. So why, why import them all? That makes sense. Um, sorry, my mouse has gone to sleep again. So it's only data. And it's, it's thinking of it as an interviewee. There is this amazingly knowledgeable interviewee that could, could combine the data for it. All you've got to do is think what the question should be. 
So it's just like somebody comes along and you say, oh, tomorrow, your, your editor says, tomorrow you can interview this XYZ. They might be promoting a film, but you, got their, you go and get their career and you look and say, oh, yeah, I'm going to ask them about this and this. And this. You, you don't sit down with them and say, oh, tell me your life from beginning to now. That would be downloading everything. You, you narrow in on today, the film they're promoting, the last film, um, the Oscars coming up, whatever it is. But you would prepare for an interview, so why not prepare for an interview with a data set? But too, too many times I see people just click, 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 click. I don't know what I'm doing, but I think I'm answering a question. I don't think you are. So we've, we've done that. So now we're going to actually do this one for real because we've got time. And this was my grand finale. And it, you, depending, I will give you um, a URL if you want to download this, or we can just do this together as a room, and I will do it for you. So it's, this is not a killer amount. What I've done is I've got only the London ones. So I've filtered it down. There are 832,000 um, uh, sales, transactions in 20. 16 to 17, uh, but only 53,000 in London. So that's what I've got. I haven't got the full lot because I've decided to narrow it down to London. But I could everything we do for London, we could multiply up for the rest if we wanted to. Um, but e for a training course, the 800,000 is far too bulky to even do pivot tables or anything. So I'm going to use Excel. So here we've got. Um, a unique identifier, which means we can at least count the individual um, transactions. We've got, obviously, a sale price, the date it happened, the postcode, various other address details. Then remember these, because it's going to come up on the screen. Detached house, semi, terraced, flat, other. Um, old or new build, uh, freehold or leasehold, various other things, and then the rest is address data. Okay? So... Already, before I even go to the next page or get my um, Excel running on screen, what sort of questions are springing to mind that you could ask this data set? It's, from, it's transactions from the 1st of June last year to the 31st of May this year, so basically a, a calendar year up to the end of last month. Most transactions. So, uh, louder, please. What month had the most transactions? Oh, yeah, I hadn't thought of that one. Let's get into it. So there it all is, and I've got a pivot ready-made. Um, I'll just take these off, and I'll tell you what I did as well. I did a little bit of um, getting the data myself. Uh, so yeah, the date is in the rows, and the transaction is the unique ID. So it's going to just count those, and then we break those down. And those. Uh, so that didn't take long, did it? <laughs> so for this. So it's, it's just the way that Excel defaults to doing this. So there we are. Can I make it bigger for you? Would that help? So we've got a sort of fairly even, isn't it? Sort of 5,000-ish, except then uh, this part in the winter is not as much. So in the five months, there are 54,000 transactions, and it's roughly, in last year, it's 5,000 to it's between five and 6,000 a month. This one coming up to five. OK, another question. So that's a, that's a sort of simple one, but it's, you know, do you want to combine it with something else? Most expensive. The most expensive. Data, filter. What do you think it's going to be? 125 million for an apartment block in the Strand, that one they've been building for a while. 125 million. That's for the whole block? Yeah. I think, unless it says apartment three, and then I'm going to be. S oh, no, it is apartment 28. Jeez! 
I mean, that one, look at that, uh, Knightsbridge, 90 million. See, this is what makes, when people say the average house price in London, this stuff is what screwing us <laughs> up. Okay, did you expect anything that big? Right, um, so that's a good old basic um, bit of filtering uh, and, and sorting. Um, what other questions might we ask? So you could do that by postcodes and addresses. You, you could, and then what I realised when I first did postcode, there are so many individual postcodes, especially if you do the whole of Britain, uh, but even for London, there's, if you think about it, the two parts of the postcode gives you a huge range of combinations. And yet the second, the, the, that number after the gap is vital. WC1V doesn't give you much. WC1V6 narrows it down to a sort of a, a post box group for, um, for one postman. Um, and so what I then, what I did was um, I called it the short postcode and I, I did what I did, I broke it off at the, uh, I separated it out into two halves and then I brought in the first digit of the second half and made it a short postcode. Now that gives you a much better idea of, of where. So now which postcode is the most, um, well I'll tell you because I already pivoted it earlier. Right, what I call the short postcode is in the rows and the unique ID is in the values and then we check and w any ideas where it's going to be the busiest for sales? Anyone want to guess a postcode that's going to be busy? Nope. E14.9. E14.9 something. I looked that up. Do you want to guess where that is? Well, it's always east. It's Tower Hamlets. Which struck me as interesting. Um, for those who don't know how to do this with a uh, pivot table, I can never resist showing you this, which is if I take that 1017 and I want to know more about it, if I just double click on that number, it makes me a complete sheet just made up of that 1017. Um, we can then play around with that and we'll see that um, in the property types, it's mostly flats. In fact, I could pivot that and say, if we do property type and unique ID, so that counts how many transactions, uh, flats by a long, long way. So we established in not many clicks um, that flats in Tower Hamlets were the biggest selling thing in the whole of London, most transactions in the whole of London last year, in the last 12 months. But then sort of shut your eyes and think, well, what else could I ask it? So this is where, you can do two types. You could, I could sit in front of this computer for hours and just keep playing with this until I find something interesting. Or you could sit back, or I could sit back and go, okay, what am I going to ask it? It's that, you know, you could, if you had, I don't know, inter an interview with Tom Cruise, you could sit and just chat if he had time and ch just chew the fat and write down some of the interesting stuff he says. Though that's the equivalent of me just going click, 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 drag, click, drag. It's kind of wasteful of time. So. You do the prep. Okay, here are the, here's the data dictionary. This is what it knows. What can I ask it? It's the same thing. You wouldn't not prepare for an interview, so why not prepare for a data set uh, analysis, however big? So what, what else could you ask? But it, having had a little chat, you can start to see things, little patterns that might be worth asking more about. I don't like to go with the crowd, uh, the, the beauty of data journalism, is, unless you're actually really obtuse, is that you can, you can do your own thing and it's, it's perfectly valid. But having an idea what you want to ask it is vital, otherwise you just waste so much time. It's almost worth just, once you've got the data dictionary, it's just, okay, there's those 10 columns I might be interested in. Go, for a, go make a cup of tea and think. Don't sit in front of the computer. I think that's the, the strongest message of my presentation is, get away from the computer and think in exactly, yeah. New builds. New builds. New builds. So let's filter that down. Um, we can quickly do that. New build and columns. They have yes and no. So if it's a new build, it's a Y. So we see that actually if we're looking at uh, Hamlets, or this is East 14, then the biggest number of sales by a long way were new builds, 752. So that's quite interesting. Of course, old build could be until two or three years ago and new, now new occupants, but this is brand new. 
which means that tells us there's been a lot of building going on in Tower Hamlets. And you can quickly say to yourself, well then, um, if I go to those new builds, um, I could, hang on a minute, I need to bring in the price, sorry. So price paid comes in uh, here. Oops, no, no it doesn't, I beg your pardon. Comes in here. Uh, and then I'm going to change that and say, give me the average. So there are the, there are the new builds, just to make it easy to read. So the average price paid was for flats, for new build flats at half a million in Tower Hamlets. I think if I were writing for something like East London Lines or something like that, I think I'm, there's, I'm getting the beginnings of, a, of a, an article here because it wouldn't take so long now to go in, OK, so I can double click on that number, find out all those, houses, all those new builds that are flats with an average of half a million and find what the cheapest one was. That'll be a given and the most expensive. I'll just have a check. Maybe then I'll possibly look at what the median and the mode were um, and see. In fact, we could. the mode won't be helpful in Excel, actually. Uh, you need to do your own price bands before you can use the mode. But the median would be quite interesting. And now I think, oh, OK. Now we see, see a bit what's going on. Uh, get rid of the outliers. But to me, it's a, it's a horrifying amount for, for um, a, a borough that was synonymous with deprivation until not long ago, and still is in some, in some senses. Um, so you then start bringing in, if you like, data or knowledge from elsewhere. What, what, do, we know, what do we know about Tower Hamlets? What's been going on there? We, you can go on Google Maps and, and have a, a check and see what's, um, what it all looks like. Go to that postcode on um, Street View and see what we're talking about. Last year, I was ch checking to see what the most purchased uh, um, postcode in Greater London was, and I found it was in Croydon. And when I went on Street View, I found it was an industrial estate where obviously they'd been selling units, um, but they'd done really well and sold loads of them. So it really it skewed the figures. Um, I think, as a sort of, well, I wouldn't say grand finale, but a finale, if I can find it, I should be able to show you a little video I did with Excel. You know, just, just let me find this. Yeah, here we go. If I open this one up. So what I did was, this is part of the basic um, spreadsheet for the accidents. This is the main one with all the accident references. And they've all got lo geolocation material, um, geolocation data on them. So if I go to uh, insert maps, 3D map. Ma most people haven't noticed that Excel's built maps into it now. It runs on Bing, but you can't, it, nobody's perfect. Oh, and it always does this when I'm doing a training course. And so, <laughs> um, Maybe I can find the MP4. It, it allows you to save the map as an MP4. This shows the accidents in time order where they happened over the day. Uh, n and the height of the column is the number of uh, casualties. So this is quite early morning still. Builds up. There's going to be a huge office block in central London soon, any moment now, at about 11 o'clock in the morning. Bus versus, there we are, bus versus taxi. Nobody dead, but big one, 40-something people injured. And it just goes on, and all the, you see all the urban areas just growing. Um, and then it starts to get dark. This is um, this, the last Friday before Christmas, 2013. Um, it's going to get to evening. And there were 617 incidents that day. And it quietens down, little ones are popping up. And I remember the last one is some poor guy runs into a tree up in Scotland. It's, I think it was one of these two up here. So that's what you can do. That was just saying, oh, there must have been a day which has most accidents. I mean, there will be one day out of the year which has more than any other. So I took that day and then used the location, material, location data to make a, um, an Excel 
map with it, which then I made that in Excel. It took me 15 minutes. Which Excel do you have? Oh, I don't know. So you need the latest version? <laughs> uh, 13 onwards. 13 onwards, okay. But as I've I may have said to you, I certainly said to other people today, Excel is only £80 a year. I mean, Office is £80 a year. And you get multiple, you can put it on multiple devices and you can give it to multiple people. Yeah, I do have Excel. I just, I didn't yeah. know. It's under Insert. And in, in among all the graphs and graphics and things, there's one called Maps. And it's, it's built in. And then the map thing, once you do this, allows you to export it as a video. So that's an MP4 video. And, it, and you can play with it. Uh, I made it one minute duration, but you can do anything you like. Um, so I hope that, as I said, that's my grand finale. Um, but I hope that makes you feel a little bit better about dealing with open data, uh, with uh, large data. Um, if it doesn't, I'm very sorry. <laughs> it will be a curse. Mm. ask the questions, but if you did find that you still a free big data set and you had to download in two parts, how you, is it easy to make, combine them into one data set? De well, it does depend what you're running it, looking at it in. Well, just, that um, housing one was only 50,000 rows, and it's fairly, well, it's, it's manageable. Once you get past 100,000 rows in Excel, it slows down. It's still doable, but I would never use it on a training course because every click is several minutes waiting. If you're at home, you will drink a lot of tea or coffee that day because a lot of things will slow. be slow. If you're going to use SQL and things like that, then that's easy. And also the combination ability within SQL to import m multiple data sets and then interrogate them all um, simultaneously is much, much easier in SQL. I have a book, the complete book on, on SQL, which uh, David Donald recommended to me, which is that thick. But but the cheat sheet you need for journalistic work with, X, with SQL is, is literally one sheet. There are six or seven commands, depending on which version you use. That's all you need, six or seven commands. The rest is learning how to combine them because you're asking questions. So you're saying, it's, it's select from where, group by and order by. That's five, and there's a couple of others where you can make extra tables. And it's just working out what you're doing in comparison with something in Excel. So select means show me these columns from this data set. So you give it the address. Where, so you can filter it. So where this is bigger than 1,000, where that is less than 10, where that is 2018 or later, whatever. Group by is a sort of a bit of a pivot where you say, OK, now put them in this, put all the ones in this column together. And order by, please put them in alphabetical or descending order of size or whatever. And that's pretty much it. The rest is all about how you combine it. So because you can do a join where you'd say, select, uh, select these columns from these three data sets where, and then you join um, the key thing, which is usually the unique identifier, is the same if you're bringing them from it. Um, and then you ask the other question. Ultimately, when you've brought that in and you find that the bit you want is only 5,000 lines, you make it a spreadsheet. If SQL itself, the database, is like, uh, could be, I always, I, for some reason I always think of Senate House Library in the University of London because it's tall and it's full of books. So, but you're, all you're doing is going to the little bloke who's in the lobby and saying, please can I have all the books by Charles Dickens written after 1865? And they then bring you just that. So you're going to the front door, and you're not getting the whole data set. Right? But, but the person, who, the architect who builds the tower full of books knows far more than you do about SQL. You just have those five commands you want. Does that make sense? I think so. If you Google SQL cheat sheet, for example, yeah. there, are there are three or four slightly different flavors of SQL. MySQL, SQL, SQLite. Um, and it just depends, I mean, the actual, all it is, is it's just bringing data to your um, screen in a, in a different, by a different route or different, slightly different language. Um, there is, a, do you have Firefox? Yeah. 
there is a thing called SQLite Manager. So SQLite, sorry, is the other one I was thinking of. Um, so SQLite Manager runs as an add-on to Firefox for free. Um, if anybody wants to uh, install it here, I will show you how to do it individually because I c everything I show you, it's been done on mine, so I can't show you how to do it because it's already done and I can't undo it. <laughs> but I can show you how to do it. Um, that could get you started. And honestly, um, I mean, there are SQL, there's been a SQL track running today for three hours. Um, and you can learn quite a lot in that time. It's quite slow going because they're being very cautious and deliberate. But once you've got, once you've been told that it's not actually that difficult and you're willing to make mistakes, you cannot do SQL against deadline. But if you spend a few hours learning the basics, you'll probably be able to. Right? I would say five or six hours of actual practicing, you'll, you'll get the hang of it. It really is simple. You know, it, as journalists, we're only using five or six commands. Um, Krina, who's been co-training today, um, she was going to show me how to. There's a thing called Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio. I tried to install it at home, and I cannot get it to work the way hers does on these lab computers here. Um, but that's a free, a lot of the stuff, with SQL itself is a free language, it's not proprietary. Um, Oracle charge for MySQL, but um, you can get a lot for free. And SQLite is free, SQL itself is free, and, they, and once you've got a, a, a manager, a, a viewer, if you like, client, um, you're laughing, because it's, it's all free. Okay, you're free to go. <laughs>